Welcome to Discovering. There are a number of things that signify the onset of spring. Firing up the grill for the first time. The familiar sight of buckets hanging from maple trees. The return of countless birds. But probably no one thing does more to convince us that spring has sprung than the evening chorus of frogs and toads. Sit back and listen to the frogs. It's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Frogs, toads, green ones, brown ones, peepers, bullfrogs, they're all around us, but what's their story? Why are they singing and where do they go when they stop? I tagged along with Walt and Phyllis Carlson on one of their annual frog surveys to find out more. We're standing on something called the Norway Mirror. Mirror is a word that means uh, a shallow swamp area. This is technically not a swamp, it's an open water area. It was dug by people for the sole purpose of providing wildlife habitat for aquatic animals. We have frogs and toads chirping away back there, practicing for this evening's seminar when it will get much, much louder than this. Once things get started this spring, the, op the ponds themselves are going to be fringed with a lot of cattails, which provide habitat for mostly birds, but if frogs and things crawl into the root system also. Frogs like different habitats in different parts of their life. Obviously, at this time of year in the spring, they're more interested in making new frogs, laying eggs, and so they start to get together in areas like this in order to attract females. The, the ones you hear talking are all males, by the way. Females never make any noise. So these guys are trying to attract females and at the same time defend their little piece of the swamp. Once the females come in, and they are climbing in now to some extent, but they will continue to do that depending on the type of frog we're talking about for, oh, some number of weeks yet to come. That actually well into the summertime for some of the frogs. The male grabs hold of the female, sits on her back, hangs on, and as the female is exuding eggs into the water, the male runs his sperm or his milt into the water on top of them, and they become externally fertilized. As soon as that's all done, they let go of each other and they take off for their summer range, which for some of these animals could be miles from here. Most of these animals will live in the forest, in the wooded areas. They don't live in the lakes all the time. There are some, some of the frogs that do, but in the background I'm hearing spring peepers and I'm hearing toads for the most part. Neither one, which will be here in another month. They'll be off into the woodland around here, chasing insects, bugs, whatever it is they're looking for for dinner, and won't come back here again until next spring when they get to do this all over again. Frogs are down here this time of year laying eggs, or going to be laying eggs, except right here we came up with one that is beyond the egg stage. This is a tadpole, obviously. This particular one is fairly good size. Tadpoles do get bigger from different kinds of frogs. This particular one is from a green frog. The eggs are after they're laid, normally are hatched into little tadpoles in seven, eight, nine days, depending on the weather a little bit. And then they will stay in the water that they're living in for anywhere from, say, three to about five weeks at which time they will start to develop legs. They breathe with gills, just like fish do. They live underwater until such time as the hind legs are formed, and then they have both gills and a lung, which develops at that time. And they start learning how to breathe surface air so that when they come ashore, they're able to live up here. This guy is a second year tadpole. He was laid a year ago by a green frog as an egg, just like anything else would be. And he's been able to live all last summer make it through the winter and here he is in the spring as a tadpole in about june maybe early july this year he will start to develop legs and crawl away like a like a green frog should 
This particular frog, obviously, the tadpole, normally lasts two years in the water. We have a bullfrog in the area, which is larger, and his tadpole can actually give three, maybe even four years as a tadpole before he becomes a frog and becomes a bullfrog that we would recognize as such. Michigan Frog and Toad Survey has been going on for 18 years now. It's actually part of a nationwide herp survey. Um, in the state of Michigan, there's like 100 and 899 sites being surveyed. In the UP, 140 sites. Um, average 10 sites per survey, so that gives you an idea how many people are doing surveying. Um, in the last 18 years, they've reported some decline in certain species. Uh, Walt and I have noticed on our own surveys um, there are a few species that seem to be in decline but then the years of the drought we noticed some major differences and now the last couple of years a lot more water we're starting to see some of those frogs that we weren't hearing for the last couple of years starting to come back. So we have the, the 10 sites and what we do is we go out three times a year, kind of a set criteria um, based on time and temperature. And we go to each of these sites. One of the things we have to do is we have to learn the sound of all the types of frogs that can be found in our area. In Michigan, there are 13 different species of frogs. One does not occur in the UP. That's a particular type of a toad. But the other 12 do. Our very first frog in the spring is typically something called the wood frog. And he has an interesting call. He's already quit calling for this year. He's done laying his eggs. Uh, he and his mate, his lady friends, and all of his male friends have gone back into the woods. They are wood frogs after all. The second one that most wood people do recognize is the spring peeper. And I think everybody knows what a spring peeper sounds like. They do not live in these little ponds, except for a few weeks in the springtime when they're down here doing their mating call. Another type that we'll run into the eastern gray tree frogs, which are the ones people occasionally see in their backyards, on their kitchen windows, maybe on the windshield of their car. Next one we're going to likely run into is uh, the leopard frog, which is a frog that most people recognize. the big square skin that blotches all over him. The one that most people would recognize instantly is the green frog. He's um, kind of a kermit frog. He makes a sound very much like the stringing of a banjo or a string, a string of a banjo being plucked. Right behind him we might run into a mink frog which is rather unusual in this part of the UP but we do have them down here. And of course the granddaddy of all of them, the bullfrog, comes out. toward the very end, usually late June or July. And in between all these, we have one toad in northern Michigan, the American, Eastern American toad. Um, and he's a toad that you find in your gardens. He's either large or small. Many people have seen little baby toads hatching in July and just thousands of them on the ground at once heading away from them. Toads have a, a skin that's a little thicker than frogs, so they don't have to worry about drying out quite as much as frogs do. All frogs and toads are able to breathe through their skin. They don't have to breathe through their lungs. They're able to osmose air right through the skin into their bloodstream and stay alive that way quite readily. But that means the skin needs to be wet or it doesn't work. So as long as the skin stays wet, they're able to breathe. How does a frog survive winter? He'll either burrow to the bottom of a pond, some do, or he'll go out into the woods and scoop down through the leaves until he reaches bare dirt and just hunker down try to stay wet. And as long as the skin stays moist, he's able to breathe underwater, under the soil, all winter long. His respiration goes down to next to nothing, and hopefully next spring he comes out in pretty good shape and ready to go again. So I was trying to find some toads for you, and instead of finding toads, I was finding wood frog tadpoles. And you can see how tiny they are compared to that green frog tadpole we saw. These were just, the eggs were laid within the last two weeks. They hatch very, very quickly. They will be frogs by the end of the summer. We also have some of our wonderful nemesis here, um, mosquito larvae. 
they're one of the hazards of the job, unfortunately, is to uh, um, get chewed up by mosquitoes. So quite a bit of difference in size and maturity rate of the various species of frogs. From summertime, they'll be all over the woods. They'll be this big. And they eventually become adults that are about this big. We've gotten away from the open water, and you've got to keep in mind that frogs don't all like the same habitat. Some frogs you'll find in many habitats, other frogs you'll find only in a single habitat. So down here in this little area, this is truly a swamp. A swamp is defined as an area that has pretty much permanent water and trees growing in it. But as you look off to the side, you see forest. Everything around here is all woods. And that's actually where most of these frogs live. They, they do not live in the water. Frogs don't all come to the pond at the same time. Certain species come first, followed by another species, followed by another, and it's triggered by environmental conditions, the length of the day, the, how warm it is, whether the pond is frozen or not frozen. The wood frogs will actually come into a pond while it's still frozen and wait it out. The rest of them aren't quite that anxious, so they come a little bit later on. And when we first arrived here, we heard lots of frogs calling, and you notice how quiet it is now? They know we're here, and they quiet down. When we're doing a survey, we'll arrive, or when a car like that goes by, the frogs will stop. They don't have to sit quietly and stand quietly for a little while before they'll start back up again. Hi, I'm Brian Whitens from 906 Outdoors. I'd like to thank you for watching our show and invite you to visit our online store. You'll find a variety of outdoor products from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and more. You'll find unique items like handmade fishing creels, trapping baskets, quivers, nets, snowshoes, hand-forged knives and more. Top quality products like Hidden Hunter Portable Blinds, Rapid River Knives, Fishing Tackle, Stormy Cromers, and food products too. Check us out anytime at 906outdoors.com. And again, thanks for watching. As we've moved into a different type of an area, as you can tell from the background behind me again, we're in a very heavily wooded area right now. And, and keeping in mind, this is where the frogs live most of their lives, well, except for the winter time, is up here in the forest. Uh, they climb trees, many of them do, some don't, but many of them do. Uh, they crawl around on the ground under the leaves. They get very active in the morning when the dew is on the ground because they have to get their skin wetted up again. And every chance they get to brush against a wet leaf during the daytime, you'll find that they will do that. This is an area that's a little unique. When we set up our route originally, the concept was not only to get a certain number of places together, but to try to come up with a diversity of different types of habitat, wetland habitat, that the frogs might find enticing to come down and do their breeding thing in the summertime. This is a vernal pond. This is a place that a month from now will have no water in it. It is a pond that's here in the springtime, predominantly the snow melt that collects in these little low hollow areas. It supports a type of vegetation around the side that needs a lot of moisture for its root growth. One nice thing about a vernal pond is there are very few predators. If we put a frog into a lake, frogs will be predated very heavily by the existing animals, whether they be fish or turtles or otters or whatever may be down there chomping away on the frogs. This part of Michigan, in the central part, we really don't have a lot of open water. We've got a few lakes. We have a few streams, and, and there are very few streams, by the way, that support much of a frog population for the same reason. Streams tend to be full of fish and also flowing water, which makes it difficult for the tadpoles to stay in one place while they're developing into frogs. They will, and they can live in streams, but it's, it's not a common situation. West of us, going off into Iron County and into Gogebic County, many, many, many more lakes. As we go east of here, we start to pick up many more lakes, particularly when we get near the east end of the UP. Here in the center, we're a little bit thin on that sort of a thing. So these little vernal ponds, and there aren't that many, there are not that many, and they're not close to one another, become probably the main habitat for most of our smaller frog species. We're not going to find the large frogs in here, the bullfrogs, the green frogs. They're not going to inhabit these things to any large extent because the water's not deep enough for them. There's just not enough there. But the frogs that you might hear in the background and the toad that you do hear in the background um, do like these little ponds. They're going to be here. They come down to the pond in the spring. They set up their little chorus. They start chirping like crazy in the nights that they're able to. Cold nights will shut them down. Rain will, actually rain actually gives them a kind of an edge. They kind of like rain. It's, it's wetter, so I guess they think the sound is better. 
females would come thundering down the hillside two or three weeks after the males have gotten down here and set up their little territories. Maybe thundering isn't the right word, but they will come hopping down the hillside. And uh, they will come down, watch, listen. Females never say a word. Males just chirp away down there trying to entice the females and, and again to set up their little breeding territory and keep the other frogs out of it. They'll mate, they'll lay their eggs, and they'll turn around and go right back into the woods. Once a male has mated, he has no reason to stay there much longer, so in a day or two or three later, he'll follow back up into the woods also and start doing his summer thing, which is predominantly gathering food and staying alive, just like all the other animals are doing out here. Vernal ponds, the mainstay for the Michigan frogs here in the Northcott Woods, and that's just like this little pond behind me. Without it, we probably would not have half the number of frogs that we have right now. In addition to going to each site and reporting what frogs we hear, we also report changes that we see to the sites over the years. Things like this logging operation, uh, maybe new housing development, new road, driveway, things like that, because that can change the whole dynamic of the wetland. And then over the years, they can see if there's a change in frog populations since that change in the habitat has occurred, or maybe, they're, maybe they'll decrease, maybe they'll increase. It can ch uh, logging can change water temperature, lets more light in, increases small growth of trees. Um, the road development can cut water off to a site completely. So changes are some of the things that we also report on our survey report every year. The habitat of this site is actually a small lake and it's the only really deep water site we have. It's also the only site on our route that we hear mink frogs. Now mink frogs are exclusive to the UP. They do not have them in lower Michigan at all. They're one of the species that they think is in the decline. Problem is they're very hard to survey. They don't come out until later in the year like July, but they also don't like to come out until very, very late at night or extremely early in the morning when most people aren't willing to go out and do the routes. Um, we have heard them here a few times, though. Um, their call sounds like horses' hooves on cobblestones. This is you know, about the only way you can really describe it. It is a wives' tale that you get warts from toads. As a matter of fact, when you pick up a toad and it suddenly releases liquid all over you, it is not peeing on you. It's actually a reservoir of water they keep by their back legs to keep them from drying out. And they release it to discourage something from eating them. But actually they've got a defense mechanism here. These little glands right here exude a substance that can be very kind of nasty and caustic. Actually, small animals that can actually be poisonous to them. And it's a defense weapon in addition to that liquid that they give off. One of the things we're doing while we're trying to determine whether the population of frogs is going up, going down, even staying the same, is to try to find out what's going on by doing a, a, a counting of them. And yet that's not the right term to use because we don't and can't go out and actually physically count frogs. Frankly, we can't find most of them because they're hiding underwater or back in the woods. One thing, however, is very noticeable when you come down to these little white and marshy areas is the fact that the frogs are making noise. And right now in the background, I'm sure you can hear two different kinds of frogs chirping away. And there is a third one in the background that you probably can't hear over the noise of the other two. Each type of frog has a very distinctive voice, very, very distinctive voice. And what we do is we've learned those voices, we've learned the sounds that they make, and what we'll do is we come to one of our survey sites and we'll stand there in the dark, and even darker than it is now, and simply wait for the frogs to do what it is that they do, as hard as they can do it. And then we make some gut, gut decisions. We try to determine whether the sound that we're hearing from hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of different frogs, is a continuous overlapping sound of one type of frog. 
so that it's not a chirp and a chirp and a chirp. It's more of a constant sound that we hear. Uh, and when we do that, we determine there are a lot of that kind of frog out there. If we go to a site and we find out there's not quite that many sounds coming in from that particular kind of frog, in other words, we hear a lot of them, they, they make a lot of noise, and then there's a quiet period, a lot more noise, more of a quiet period, we decide, well, there's not nearly so many of these as there were the other one. And then we get down to the lowest level where we go out, and only once in a while do you hear a frog of that particular species making the sound that he makes. Uh, they all try to do their best, and I keep remembering the fact that they do come up at different times of the year, sequentially, one right after the other. So one not making very much noise either is at the end of his breeding season or perhaps right at the very beginning of it. Or another thing that happens, if you get something very, very loud, uh, it actually physically drowns out the quieter frogs. They're, they're not all quite so, so noisy as the ones that you hear in the background right now. Right now there's leopard frogs calling out. There's one over here, and I can hear one over here, and then one over here. I can literally count them. One, two, three. It's a density level one. If you can count an individual frog, one, two, three, four, and there's some overlap in the calls, but there's still few enough of that species that you can literally count them, then you're a density level two. And then when there's so many, like these spring peepers and the American toad spine is calling, you literally can't count them, that's a density level three. So we obviously count what we can hear, and we put them down on pieces of paper and send them in for tallying, where they're combined with all of the other frog counters all over the state of Michigan. And this is put together in a final format so that we can try to determine, are we losing frogs? Are we gaining frogs? What kind of frogs are we losing or gaining? And from this data, we begin to put some information together that the biologists are able to use in some of their other studies and, and again let's make determinations on perhaps quality of the environment here in this part of Michigan here in the UP. Right now I think it's pretty good. Well that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Now, see, this is how you do a frog survey. So, Mr. Toad, what is your preferred habitat? And what do you prefer to eat?